be in prison anymore. Not, we're a place, live. not a place we're to live. build houses. Good morning. We are live on the internet, and good morning to all of you on this very, very rainy uh, Sabbath day, thanks to Matthew. Janetta was showing me a picture a while ago of uh, the, a picture of the, a satellite picture of the storm, and the caption read, Mark, Luke, and John, come get your buddy. <laughs> the next hurricane will be named Matthew. <coughs> I'm sorry, Mark. The next one will be named Mark. Oh, the next one's named Nicole. She's chasing Matthew. Well, we got one out in the ocean called Nicole. Now, if Nicole and Matthew get together, there'll be all these little tornadoes they'll produce. Oh, yeah. That's exactly what we're doing. Little tornadoes. Well, good morning. Let's ask God's blessing. I'm going to go ahead and pray and we'll get started. Father in heaven, we thank you now for this uh, rainy day. We ask you to bless all those who are still on their way coming to church today and around the world where Sabbath services are being held. Protect us all. Bless and anoint the service today uh, with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've got something here I got off the internet just last night called, uh, the title is Russia Warns of Nuclear World War III. This is a warning from Soviet, well not Soviet now. I used to, I'm so used to, when I grew up, I was so used to calling it Soviet Russia, Soviet Russia, so I'm still doing But if Putin has his way about it, it might be another Soviet Russia. A Russian newspaper <clears throat> fears a third world war with the U.S. In, over Syria. This is from the newspaper called The Sun. This was written on Thursday, just two days ago. Tabloid Makovsky Consumlets predicts a direct, quote, a direct military confrontation, unquote, on par with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, some of you don't remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. I do. People were scared out of their wits. They were buying fallout shelters like they're going out of style. The Russians are coming. They're going to bomb us. People are getting their fallout shelters and putting potatoes in there and getting ready for living in a fallout shelter. Uh, in fact, uh, Twilight Zone did an episode on this guy living in a fallout shelter or about to live in a fallout shelter and how the neighbors were wanting to get in there and didn't have enough food for it. So they were going to take a gun and shoot their own neighbors, keep them out of the fallout shelter. You know, what might realistically happen in such a situation? <clears throat> the article continues, the U.S. suspended contact with Russia over Syria on Monday. Secretary of State John Kerry has been enraged by airstrikes on rebel-controlled areas of Aleppo. This goes from metro.co.uk, wrote on October 4th, so this was just uh, three days ago. As tensions rise in the Middle East and the official TV channel in Russia has issued a chilling warning that war with the West could be imminent. Makes you wonder if we're living in the last days. Zavita, a national or a nationwide TV service run by the country's Ministry of Defense, said last week, quote, schizophrenics from America, that's how they talk about it, are sharpening nuclear weapons for Moscow. Both Russia and NATO are still in the position to unleash global scale nuclear attacks and the weapons are armed and ready. I mean, what kind of a crazy, mad, insane world are we living in? How close are we to the time of the second coming of Jesus? <clears throat> the next paragraph says, <clears throat> what would a nuclear blast actually do? This is a quotation from the newspaper. What observers fear is a military or political confrontation which builds up tensions around a nuclear missile attack, possibly leading, to, leading one side to fire. Hydrogen bombs would destroy most civilian buildings in a 10-mile radius based on a 20-megaton weapon exploding 3.3 miles above the ground. They could, you know, do it above the ground now. The effects on people nearby would be even more frightening with a blast killing thousands or millions, they don't know, instantly, followed by poisoning from radioactive fallout from the blast. Witnesses of the Hiroshima attack said that people near the center of the blast vanished. Their shadows, by the way, are still on the wall. The light was so bright, it's like it took a photograph of their image, and the shadow is on the wall where they were standing for the blast to happen. But there's nothing left of the people. William Burkett said, quote, of thousands of others, near the center of the explosion, there was no trace. They vanished. The theory in Hiroshima is that the atomic heat was so great that they burned instantly to ashes, except that there were no ashes. The ashes is vaporized. Then the Federalist Paper Project wrote on October 5th, again, two, three days ago, Zavita, 
breathlessly reported that underground nuclear bunkers have been built to house 12 million, enough to house the entire population of Moscow. Boy, they're getting serious. If we attack America, they will attack us back, so let's get ready for the attack. Russia's nuclear stockpile is the largest in the world with 8,400 warheads. America has 7,500. The Russians have also launched a nationwide civil defense training exercise in preparation for an all-out war with the West. I thought all that was over and done with. Cold War is over. It's starting. Starting up again. Hey, don't they know if they shoot at us that we're going to shoot back at them and that both these countries is going to be gone? Well, if they build these underground bunkers, then when the war is over, they can come out. But how long will they have to stay in those bunkers till the fallout? They cover out. It's insanity. It is absolute insanity. Hey, they ain't got enough food to stay in there long enough. Yeah, for 12 million people, where are they going to get all the food? Yeah, right. The Independent reports, quote, lasting three days, the exercise being run for the, by the Ministry of Civil Defense, emergencies and elimination, of consequences of natural disasters. That is the title of an organization. It's called Emricom. Will evolve 200,000 emergency personnel and the cooperation of 40 million civilians. The Daily Mail on October 5th said that Russia is evacuating more than 40 million people in drills to prepare for nuclear war. They're already, they're, I mean, they're taking it seriously. So who's going to start the war? Who's going to fire the first shot? Hopefully it won't be America. Maybe Russia is actually planning it. They know they're going to get attacked back, so they're getting ready for it. The last sentence here, in their doomsday broadcast, they told viewers that the United States would, quote, face terrible tectonic consequences. I don't know what tectonic in this context means. Earthquake. Earthquakes. If they took action against the Syrian regime. So, now we have a threat from Russia again, since first real serious threat since Ronald Reagan, I guess. Now, here's another article. It's a bit long, but it's worth reading. This uh, was just yesterday, October the 7th. Temple Mount and Land of Israel Faithful Movement, Jerusalem, Israel. And this is about something that just recently happened over there. Now, you know, Gershon Solomon, who's the head of this, whom I've met, he wants to build the temple, and the whole movement does a lot of Israelis are supported, a lot of Americans support it, and let me just read some, I'm not going to read the entire article. For the first time in archaeological history in Israel, Israeli archaeologists have discovered extremely exciting remains that were part of the reconstruction project of the Second Temple, sometimes called the Herodian Temple, although it was really built in Ezra's day, and the Temple Mount during the time of King Herod, the King of Israel during the era of 37 to 4 BC, 37 BC, 4 BC. So what he did, he embellished it, he built it up, <clears throat> but that temple was already at that time 500 years old. Uh, the beautiful and exciting find of luxurious opus sectile tiles, I know what tiles are, but I don't know what in various geometric shapes and painted in exquisite, exquisite colors are those which covered the temple floor. See, the Muslims say they never had a temple on the Temple Mount. Proven now they've wrong, found baby. the tiles. Proven them wrong, baby. Yeah, proven them wrong. <clears throat> um, and the other important service areas of the Holy Temple Mount where pilgrims gathered during the Second Temple period up till, of course, 1870. Never before since the destruction of the Jewish Temple on the Holy Temple Mount in the year AD 70, oh, he says 70 CE, meaning common era, has such a unique and important discovery of remains from the construction of the Holy Temple itself been found. This unprecedented discovery has raised up great excitement in Israel. So right now, this week, they are excited about this. And the Muslims are still saying, no, oh, there, there was never a temple there. there. They can change history, rewrite history as they want to. It is clear. It is a clear message from God to the people of Israel that it is time to build the third holy temple for the God of Israel, and with no delay. Folks, they're getting serious now in Israel. They're getting serious. It is now time to build the temple with no delay. I won't read this whole article. Let me skip down about a paragraph here. It was also the godly introduction to the next Jubilee in 2017. Now, they said 2015 was Jubilee. 
And they're not referring to the biblical jubilee because they're counting from 67 when they took the old city. So they just so okay, this is 50 years from that period of time. What was 2015? I don't know. Even the Pope said that was jubilee. Of course, you have furniture stores around here. We are celebrating our jubilee sale. You know, and some people just use the term very loosely. This is not the same as the biblical jubilee. In fact, how many of you know how the Jews count their biblical jubilee? Anybody know? It's not every 50 years. Did you know that? Most of you didn't know that. It's every 49 years. So when is the jubilee? I guess it's year one of the next 50. So they have a 49-year count. So no matter when they think the jubilee is, they're, they're miscounting it because if you read Leviticus 25 very carefully, it is an exclusive count. It's 47, 48, 49, 50, and then the next year is one. I won't take the time now to prove it, but I can easily prove that. But again, Jewish tradition supersedes the actual written word. They greatly increased the desecration that Muslims did of the holy hill of the God of Israel when they intentionally threw tons of holy ground from the Holy Temple Mount into a garbage dump outside the walls of the Holy Temple Mount. So then the Jews went out there and started sifting through the garbage and found these tiles that go back 2,000 years. The Muslims adamantly deny that the two Jewish temples ever existed on this holy place. They also want to stop any Jewish intentions to rebuild the Jewish temple that King David 3,000 years ago dedicated to the only location, the only location, you can't build one in Salt Lake City, won't count, the only location for the Holy Temple of the God of Israel universe. The exciting discovery, I'm, I'm skipping all of this, of these majestic floor tiles from the second temple found in the very same earth that the Muslims wanted to use to disgrace and dishonor Israel have instead brought outstanding favor and glory to Israel. And I made a little note here, Romans 8, 28, put that aside. Everybody knows what that is, I hope. If you don't, look it up. The people of Israel continue to reclaim their biblical heritage. During the ongoing and intricate sifting of the holy ground from the holy temple mount, approximately six, listen to this, 600 beautiful and luxurious segments of floor tiles have been found. 600 of them. And yet the Muslims say there was no building there. Only the, the mosque was ever there, but, but no temple. So, let's see. Well, here's one last thing you're going to read to you. The archaeologist Dr. Gabriel Barque from Bar Ilan University, uh, he was overseeing the sifting process. He said, for the first time, we have the privilege and opportunity to see one part of the great glorification of the second holy temple since archaeologists have been able to successfully restore an element from the Herodian second temple complex. Josephus, the Jewish historian who lived during the time of Herod's temple, he was born in the 30s, am I correct on that? Or 37. Yeah. Third round, 37, born in the 30s. He talks, here's what he said, quote, Who can describe the tiles of the temple and the temple mount, tiles that were created from precious stones that were brought from many countries? All of the square tiles under the heaven of the holy temple mount were filled with beautiful, glorious, and colored stones of many shapes, end of quotation. Also, the Talmud talks about it, and I won't go any further with that. So anyway, they are getting very excited now, and they're saying now is the time to build the temple without any further delay. That doesn't mean they're going to, but do you understand? They're serious. They're going to build it. All right, any questions on that? If they had to let this house stay down there, they wouldn't take them so long to build the temple, would they? <laughs> well, the Muslims control the Temple Mount because Moshe Dayan gave them control over the Temple Mount in the 67 day war. They had total control of the old city. They could have built their temple then, but Moshe Dayan offered an olive branch to the Muslims said, okay, you can have the Temple Mount. All right, without further ado, we're going to hear from Dr. John Roller today. He's going to be giving us, uh, I won't say it, he's going to be talking about hell today. <laughs> Give him hell today, right? That's what I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we have been doing a series on hell, and uh, so far what we've covered is the uses of the Hebrew word Sheol in the Old Testament, um, as translated in the King James Version as either pit or grave. So I, I wanted to cover those first because those are, those are clear and simple, um, and to me they should be the pattern setters to be able to understand the rest of the 
uses of the word Sheol, where the King James Version chose to translate by the word hell, H-E-L-L in English, um, instead of pit or grave. So first, let's remember that the reason they used pit or grave was because the original meaning of the word Sheol was a hole in the ground. And a pit is a hole in the ground, and the grave is a hole in the ground. So always, it should be a hole in the ground of some kind. And of course, the English word hell is actually related to the English word hole. They both come from the German word hell, H-O-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, which can be derived into either hole or hell. So let's look at some of the verses in the Old Testament where the King James translators made this choice use the word hell, and see if there's any reason why it shouldn't be pit or grave. No, I don't. Um, I, have, I gave the same handout. Uh, it should say Sheol is pit, Sheol is grave, and then Sheol is hell. Okay. So we start with Deuteronomy 32, 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest Sheol, and shall consume the earth with their increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. In my edition of the King James Version, there's actually a little note on the word hell. It says Hebrew Sheol off at the side. So I put the Hebrew Sheol in there. And then I ask, why should it be translated hell? Why shouldn't it be translated? The fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest pit. I'm sorry, what was the reference? Deuteronomy 32... 22, and uh, shall burn, uh, burn unto the lowest pit, and shall consume the earth with their increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountain. This is a fire that's going to cause a meltdown, right? It's going to burn down to the lowest hole in the ground, and destroy the earth from the bottom up. Now, obviously, this whole uh, statement is kind of uh, figurative, so to speak. Uh, it's poetic. Uh, it's part of a song, actually. Deuteronomy, all of chapter 32 is the song that Moses um, sang to the congregation of Israel. I'm going to have time to examine the whole point, but the, the, uh, the point that I'm trying to raise is why use the obscure word L here when they could just as easily have said pit, grave, hole in the ground. 2 Samuel 22.6 is the next time this comes up. Oh, and, and by the way, I was going to say this, too. The King James Version was not translated by an individual. It was translated by a committee, a big team of scholars. 57, something like that. 54 to start with, and that's 47. 54, 47, a bunch of scholars. And part of the methodology that they used was to give individual scholars individual books to translate. So what I wanted to say about that was Deuteronomy, this is the only reference to Sheol in Deuteronomy. And that's why we don't, that may be one of the reasons why it wasn't translated pit or grave is because the guy who was working on Deuteronomy, this was the only time he ever saw the word, because he didn't study all those other books. Similarly, in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel 22.6 is going to be the only occurrence of Sheol in 2 Samuel. So the, the translator 2 Samuel doesn't have any other words to compare it with. 2 Samuel uh, 22.6, though, gives us, uh, first of all, it's another song, another poetry, another poetic statement, not to be taken literally. Uh, it's a song that David sang in the day that the Lord delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies and out of the hand of Saul, it says in 2 Samuel 22, 1. And he's talking about how bad things got during his life, and he said, the sorrows of Sheol compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me. Now, the parallelism very clear here. Sheol is death. Is that maybe one of the reasons why maybe I'm jumping to ahead in the verses that uh, when referring to a, uh, a pit or grave, it's referring to a place that somebody is in. When maybe when they're using the word hell, it's talking about a separation. But you see, that's the problem with the English. If you if you read the Hebrew here. Sheol is parallel to death. The sorrows of the grave compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. 
He's talking about the fact that he thought he was going to die. And he was surrounded by the sorrow of the fact that he was about to die. So the word hell here should have been translated the grave. The sorrows of the grave I'm asking about. Job 11.8. And of course you know the whole book of Job practically is poetry. Especially the section where the friends talk to each other. So Job 11.8 is part of that dialogue that Job had with his friends. And again, poetry in Hebrew is based on parallelism. Now here, though, the translator of the book of Job had lots of occasions to use the word Sheol as grave. Job 7, 9, 14, 13, 17, 13, 21, 13, 24, 19. All five of those times he translated Sheol as the grave. And then in Job 11, 8, it is as high as heaven. We studied heaven in a previous series. What canst thou do? Deeper than Sheol, what canst thou know? Now here you have antithetic parallelism, where the parallel is the opposite rather than the same. So as high up as Shamayim, that which is elevated high, heaven, and deeper than Sheol, the deepest hole in the ground, high up to the sky, down deep to the hole in the ground, what canst thou know? What canst thou do? What canst thou know? It's as high as heaven, it's deeper than Sheol. Sheol is just a deep hole in the ground. In Job 11, 8. And why he wouldn't have translated that the grave? It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than the grave, what canst thou know? Because the grave is the deepest hole in the ground that you're ever going to go in. And the word hell is ambiguous. The word hell has no meaning whatsoever. Yeah. It's an English word that has been created to translate things in, into the Bible, and it has no definition. Job 26, 6 is the same problem having the word spirit. The English word of spirit has no definition. Job 26, 6. Again, parallelism gives you the answer. Hell, Sheol, is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. Naked is the same as hath no covering. Sheol is the same as destruction. That's what happens to somebody who's put in a hole in the ground. They are destroyed. The grave is naked before him. Destruction hath no covering. Now there's a whole bunch of references like this in Psalms. Psalm 9, 17. Of course, we know that everything in Psalms is poetry. It's not a single prose statement in the entire book. Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned into Sheol, and all the nations that forget God. The nations that forget God are the wicked, and the destiny of those people is to be turned, that is relocated, into Sheol. Now, you can see why the King James translators wanted that to be hell. Because they had Dante's Inferno in mind. They grew up in the Middle Ages, and they've been taught that all wicked people go to hell when they die. And they describe hell then in graphic terminology like Dante's Inferno did. So that's why they want the wicked to be turned into hell. But all it's saying is the wicked are going to die. Yeah. Be and be buried. And they'll be destroyed. And that's going to happen to all the nations that forget God. Psalm 16.10 is a great one. An important one. Because it's quoted twice in the New Testament. This is David, a miktam, which means a teaching in this case, a prophecy, because he's really talking about Jesus. Now, how do I know that? Because Peter said so. In Acts 2, 31 and 32, Peter quoted these verses, and he went to great lengths to say David wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about his son, the Messiah, when he said to God, or thou, God, will not leave my soul, which we talked about when we studied soul, Psalm 1610. Soul, we talked about soul, his whole personality, the totality of himself, in Sheol. You will not leave me in Sheol, neither will you suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Was David the holy one? Oh, he wasn't. We know his life, don't we? He was a messed up sinner that God chose to use for his own glorious purposes. The Holy One is his great son, Jesus. 
And it's Jesus who was not going to be left in Sheol, nor was Jesus going to experience corruption because he was only in the grave for three days and three nights. Or even less than that if you believe in the third day theory. So decay. Decay. That's right. The decay of the body, which is the soul, as we talked about before. Where's that in Acts? Acts 2, 31 and 32. So clearly this is talking about Jesus, whose whole person was not going to be left in. Now that's the perfect place to put the grave, because that's where he was. He was died and he was buried. He was put in the grave and he wasn't left there. He didn't experience corruption there. He was raised. And that's Peter's whole point in Acts 2, 31 and 32 is that this is the verse about the resurrection of Jesus. But what did the Catholic Church do with this verse in the Middle Ages? Jesus' soul went to hell. Went to Dante's Inferno. Where he where he preached to the spirits that were imprisoned there, which was all the people who had died in Old Testament times, and some of them got saved. And then when he got resurrected, he took them up to heaven with him. All of that was Catholic theology in the Middle Ages, which was heavily influential on the translators of the King James Version. So they thought this would be a good place to use the word hell. That will not leave my soul, the Messiah's soul, in hell. <laughs> but you're going to bring him back up again. And all David was really saying is, you will not leave me in the grave after you put me there. Neither will you allow me to see corruption. And the me here is not David, it's Jesus. Uh, so, the sign that they applied to what you're saying is, lift up your head on the I, they attest that to what you were saying about Jesus went down the hill. They might they might include that that verse in with that whole theory as well. I'm not that familiar with that part of it. Yeah. Psalm eighteen five. Uh, this is an exact quote from the verse we studied earlier, Second uh, Samuel twenty two six. The sorrows of Sheol compassed me about; the snares of death prevented me. That's the exact same verse. It just reappears in a different place in the Bible. The whole chapter. 2 Samuel 22 reappears as Psalm 18. Psalm 55, 15. Psalm 55, 15. Uh, this is a curse David pronounces on his enemies, which can easily be applied to Jesus, pronouncing the same curse on his enemy. Let death seize upon them, let them go down quick, which doesn't mean fast, it means alive. Let them go down alive into Sheol. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among men. What's he saying? He's praying that what will happen to his enemies will be like what happened to Korah, Nathan, and Abiram and their followers when they rebelled against Moses. That a crevice would open up the earth and they would be alive when they fell down into that hole and when the earth closed over them, they would die. Well, right. Margin says the grave there. Margin actually says the grave in your translation. Yeah. <laughs> Mine doesn't have a, a footnote. But, you know, how obvious could this be? Let death seize upon them and let them go down alive into the grave. Yeah. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Praying for them to go down alive into the grave. Of course, they won't stay alive there very long. You can go down into the grave alive but you won't stay alive if you stay there in the grave. You've heard people that have been buried even though they weren't dead. And, you know, they try and claw their way out of the coffin, but they end up dying. Psalm 86, 13. For great is thy mercy toward me. What's an illustration of that great mercy? Thou hast delivered my soul, which means me, from the lowest Sheol. Danger of being buried deep in a hole in the ground because he had died, but he didn't die. You delivered me from that. You spared me from death. I've had that experience. I was delivered from being put in a deep hole in the ground when I almost bled to death, and they gave me a blood transfusion. Thank you, modern technology 
and what I have to say to Jehovah's Witnesses is not pretty. <laughs> you know, you just got this fellowship. After yeah. that experience, there is no, there is absolutely zero point zero 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 percent chance that I would ever convert to Jehovah's Witness. Why? Because I know my life was saved by a blood transfusion twice. <laughs> so they got no chance with me. Psalm 116, verse 3. Seems like we heard this verse before. The sorrows of death come past me, and the pains of Sheol can't hold upon me. Right? Now, in this case, the author, who's not named, in Psalm 116, it's an anonymous uh, psalm, probably later uh, in, in Jewish history. Uh, this author has done something. He's taken a verse that David wrote back in 2 Samuel and Psalm 18, and he has included that verse in his psalm with a little explanation. The sorrows of death come past me, the pains of Sheol, they hold upon me, and here's his explanation. I found trouble and sorrow. So that's what literally happened. He was in trouble. He was deeply sorrowful. And that explains what he meant by saying, I felt like I was going to die and be buried. No reason for uh, she ought to be translated hell there. The pains of hell, the pains of, the, of death. The pain of death was what I was fearing. That's another thing I learned when I was bleeding. I'm not worried about being dead. It doesn't bother me a bit, the thought of me being dead. I'm not worried about the process that you go through when you die. What I'm worried about is the pain that's involved in that process. And if I could die painlessly, it would be fine with me. And bleeding to death is a painless way to die. Because all that happens is you just get weaker and weaker and you know your vision starts to blur a little bit and you're kind of fading out. I was that close. I was I was fading out and I was thinking I'm going I had a, a I had a um, Diverticular hemorrhage. Uh, my diverticulosis, uh, one of the little diverticules broke, and a blood vessel was bleeding out through the diverticule through my intestines, throughout my colon. And the doctor said, "There's nothing we can do for you until this stops. Hmm. We can't. We can't invade it. All we'll do is cause more bleeding. We can't. There's nothing we can do to make it stop bleeding. We can't give you something to make it clot because that'll give you a heart attack. So you, we just have to hope it stops bleeding." And when it does, then we can give you a transfusion, pump you back up again. Right? So before they got to the stage of saying you stopped bleeding, and now you can have your transfusion, I think was just starting to go black. And I was thinking, well, it's probably not going to work. I'm probably going to die right here and now. And I'll never know until Jesus comes and raises me up. And that was fine with me. It was very peaceful. And for that matter, I, I wouldn't mind dying in a nuclear explosion. Providing I could be right there at ground zero and be one of those people who's vaporized and have their shadow blown up on the wall. Because those people never felt a thing. There was no pain whatsoever. In less than a millisecond, they went from being alive to being non-existent. That'll work for me. I have no problem with that. Now, we had we had fall-up shelters in my apartment building where I grew up as a kid. And my sister and I used to play down there. <laughs> Great place to play. It was in a sub-basement underneath the regular basement of the building. We found the entrance to it. We hung out there. The other kids didn't, didn't want to come and play in the basement. They had TVs to watch. But we didn't, we didn't have TV, so we had to find more entertaining things to do. Did they have a lot of food stored down there? No, no. It was a big empty room in, into which the people of the building were supposed to try to crowd if there was a nuclear explosion in New York City. Which we used to have we used to have those nuclear nuclear weapon drills mm -hmm. that you were talking about. And you get down under your, under your uh, desk, yes. put your hands behind your head, so you, your neck won't be broken by um, flying glass. <laughs> I said, flying glass? Are you kidding? We're here at ground zero. <laughs> There's going to be no flying glass. We're going to be vaporized. What's the point of this whole exercise? Uh, my, my I was smarter than the average kid when I was a kid. My, my brother explained that to me. You get down, you crouch down, you put your head between your legs, and you kiss your backside goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> exactly what you do. But, you know, the, the, real, the real point of it was for the people who lived further out in the suburbs. They weren't at ground zero, and they might be flying glass, and they might survive, okay? And then they would have to deal with the fallout and, you know, the, the, the fact that, I mean, where are you going to get food? 
If you live in Nassau County, Long Island, and New York City is vaporized, just exactly how are you going to get food? <laughs> I mean, they can only grow a limited amount of it right there on the island. Most of the, most of the island is wall-to-wall -wall housing. There were farms. So, the whole thing was stupid. It might have made sense in other parts of the country. You know, the part that made the most sense to me was they put a big nuclear shelter in the in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. Enough food there for 5,000 people to last for six months or six years. I forget that how long. Six years. But the idea was when the alarm blew off, everybody that was within driving distance just go to the cave. Right? And there was about 5,000 people that lived within driving distance. Those people would have survived. Good luck living in Mammoth Cave the rest of your life. But, you know. Psalm 139, verse 8. This one I really love because it is so contrary to popular theology. Even to this idea about being separated from God, right? Mm -hmm. Separated from God. See, you know, they about the mid-1970s, the evangelicals started getting embarrassed about this teaching that you're going to burn in hell forever and ever for your sins. And Dr. Billy Graham stopped saying that. He started saying you're going to be eternally separated from God. But Psalm 139, verse 8, in the King James Version reads, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Well, amen and hallelujah. I have no questions about the truth of that statement, except for one part. And that is, this is a totally hypothetical thing, because I cannot ascend into heaven. Jesus said, no man has ever ascended up into heaven, except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. John said that. John 3.13. So I can't ascend up into heaven, but if I could, what would I find? Thou art there. Absolutely. Or even on the moon, the second thing. Even if I ascend up into the moon, thou art there. Jim Lovell found that out. That's where the Holy Spirit worked in his heart and caused him to accept Christ as his Savior. On the moon. On the moon. <laughs> Got saved, on the moon. got saved on the moon, which proves that the Holy Spirit is there, contrary to some teachers who say that the Holy Spirit only works within the Earth's atmosphere. Wow. And if you get outside the Earth's atmosphere, you're, you're in the realm of the demons. Mm, that's, that's absolutely true. But if I ascend up into heaven, any heaven, first heaven, second heaven, or third heaven, God is there. And if I make my bed, which means I'm planning to go to sleep, right, in hell... She all, the grave, behold, thou art there. So, it is not possible to be eternally separated from God. Because if your final destiny is to go to either heaven, which it's not, or hell, which it's not, <laughs> either way, God is there. You cannot be separated from God. You can't be separated from God for a moment, let alone for all eternity. So, that, that destroys that theory completely. <laughs> yeah. And what does this verse really mean? Verse 8, if I climb up into the sky, like Keith used to do with his airplane, God is there. And if I go to sleep in the grave, God is there. That's what the verse really means. Any questions? I hope he's in the first heaven, because I talked to him when I'm up there bouncing around the clouds. Right, but you can't talk to him in the grave, as Ecclesiastes made it clear. Why? Not because he's not there, but because you're not conscious. That's why you can't talk to him in the grave. Well, Pastor Roland, what you saying about the Holy Spirit and that guy on the moon, the Holy Spirit boy up and been up, so he could have took the Holy Spirit where he could have Oh, but he didn't. He wasn't saved when he went there. Yeah, you know, he, didn't feel, you know. he didn't have the Holy Spirit in him. <laughs> he had it when he come back. He did. Because <laughs> the Holy Spirit was up there on the moon and he got into him. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, no. In other words, he didn't take the Holy Spirit with him because he didn't have the Holy Spirit. That's right. But he brought it back. Which means that God so, is up there. So by then he did. But obviously God is everywhere. And we believe that God is omnipresent. But God is everywhere. Yeah. Well, then how can he not be in hell? <laughs> well, the hell here is the grave, like it always is and always should have been throughout the entire Old Testament. We'll see the rest of the Old Testament next time. Sorry that took a little longer, but I got, I got a little digressed on the new theory. 
all of Shell Chip. That's <laughs> I can tell. I all enjoy it. I laugh when I think back on it. We took that so seriously. Oh, yeah. Sure, there could be a nuclear war and lots of people could be killed. You could be one of them. Or you could be a survivor. Either way, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope that, that when the tribulation comes, that's the part that God says will protect us from here for Philadelphia Christians. So let's hope that that, that nuclear war does not happen until the tribulation is in us that we promise protection. Today is October the 8th, is that not right? 33 years ago, in about June or July, I had just been ordained in January, and I was putting out ads in the paper trying to get the church started. And people would come to our Bible studies on Friday nights, and then they'd come once or twice. They were looking for a real church. We had three or four people show up, they wouldn't come back. So I decided in June and July, I'd need to pray about, should I go on radio? really didn't want to, but I prayed about it. And I said, God, if you tell me to, I'll do it. But now, if you don't want to, I won't. So talk to me. And he did. He kept listening. Never heard a word from God. Went all the way through July. I said, now, God, should I go on radio or not? Sometimes if God prompts you to do something, there's no point asking, do you want me to do this? Because he's already told you, and he's not going to tell you anymore. So I had the prompting. I guess it was a prompting. But I kept asking God. I said, look, I'm not going to go on radio until you tell me. I did that in June, July. I know July. And August, and come around the first week of September, <coughs> I got very serious with God. I said, should I do it or not? Because if you don't want me to, I shouldn't do it. And toward about the middle of September, I finally came to the conclusion, well, 1 John 4, 1 says, try the spirits. That means also try experiences. I said, I tell you what I do, God. I'll if this is you telling me to do this, I'll do, it. I'll do it for 30 days. That is one month. I'll go on the radio. That'd be four times in a month. <clears throat> and I'll try to start right away. And if I haven't gotten any letters, no responses in, in one month, in 30 days, I'll go off the radio. So I was only going to do it for one month. So I went down to the radio station, WRKB, which was a Christian station. They would take ministers. And I said, uh, I'd like to go on, on radio. They said, okay, fine. Uh, I said, uh, I'd like to go on on a Sunday, and I'd like to start immediately. They said, well, we can't start you immediately because of our, uh, the way we do our billing. We'll have to start you the first of next month, which would be the first of October. I said, be fine. The first Sunday in October was going to be the second day of October. I said, that's, that's great. That's fine. Then they said, well, uh, we're not going to be able to clear a time for you until the following Sunday, the 9th of October. I said, that's fine. Uh, the 9th of October, which is really weird, Coincidentally, happens to be the first day that the leader of what we now call the Sardis Church, the Radio Church of God, that was when he first won his 15 minute broadcast exactly uh, 49, or that been 50 years. Yeah, 50 years. He went on 1933. I was going on 1983, and his first broadcast was October the 9th. And when he told me we'll do it October the 9th, I thought, hey, that's interesting. That's a 50 year uh, anniversary. Jubilee. Yeah, like a Jubilee. <laughs> And, uh, but then he told me, he says, well, you're going to do kind of a teaching program, aren't you? I said, yeah. He said, well, you shouldn't be on Sunday. You ought to be on Saturday. Let's move you to Saturday. I said, that's fine. I didn't care. So uh, my first broadcast was on October the 8th. Guess what? That day, that year, was the Feast of Trumpets. And I had to do the program in September. So I did it early. But it, my first broadcast went out over the air October the 8th, 1983, which was 33 years ago today, and that was a Saturday. Interesting. My program, I'd already done it, was on the second coming of Christ, and coincidentally, they, it was aired on the Feast of Trumpets, which pictures the second coming of Christ. Fascinating. Over the years, I've been on FM, AM stations, shortwave stations here and there. Uh, nations all around the world right now are concentrating all of our efforts into this college, hoping I can get some people to say, yeah, we'll go to these other countries, we'll start a church over there. Because I've had people write me and say, hey, do you have a church in our country? Sorry, don't have a church over there. And we can't have a church over there until we get some people who are willing to represent us. I've tried to get local Sabbath keeping ministers over there, not Seventh day Adventists, to represent us, and they wouldn't do it. So I just said, well, we just have to start, get our own ministers to go over there. So some of you are married and uh, would like to pastor a church in some of these other countries. If you let me know, we'll go ahead and get back on radio over there. Once we get enough people saying we want a church over here, then we can send you over there. If you're, you could have a degree from an ambassador. You have to have at least a bachelor's degree, though, to be considered for that. Anyway, I just thought I'd share that little bit of history with you. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about the meaning of the Feast of Trumpets. Now, on the Feast of Trumpets, I went into it thoroughly, but the few weeks before that, I gave you some peripheral information. 
And then last week, I think it was, no, the week before last, I talked about the Day of Atonement. I would zero in on the real meat of the, of the meaning of this day on October the 12th. And then last week, I talked a little bit about the Feast of Tabernacles, but I hit the peripheral issues of it. Uh, on the 17th of October will be the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, and then I'll go into the details about it. Now, there's one more holy day. It's commonly called the Last Great Day. And I want to talk about that today. We'll observe that on the 24th of October. And, I, and we're going to have a service. These are on Monday. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles, the last great day, is on a Monday. So tell your boss you're going to be gone that day. You're going to be in church. If he doesn't understand that, just say, well, I'm going to be gone that day. And get a PTO time, pay time off. If they want, I used to tell you whether they paid me or not. I said, I'm going to be in church. Bye. And sometimes I lost my jobs, but I was always in church on the holy days. But here's the thing. The last great day is not understood by Protestant churches. Harry Stone, bless his heart, gets on national television and he tries to teach about the annual holy days. He comes up with seven holy days. But he always leaves out the last great day. He always leaves it out. He's not never going to teach on it. He doesn't understand it. So how does he come up with seven holy days? Well, he will take the wave sheaf, which is not a day of no survival work. It's not called a high day, a holy day, a Sabbath day. It's not called a day of holy convocation. It's a work day, and he makes that a feast day. Without scriptural support, he just says that's a feast day. Wrong. The wave sheaf is a typical day of work, like Monday through Friday. It's just a work day is all it is. It's not a holy day. don't have to have church on that day. So what is the last great day? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about this. The all holy days picture God's master plan, and it begins with Passover to get mankind into God's family. The Bible says that God is a, is a family, and so these holy days picture God's master plan. Now, if you have your Bibles handy, let's go to Leviticus 23. Harry Stone has never understood this and said, don't go to these guys to teach you about the holy days. That's like asking me to explain Buddhism to you. I know hardly nothing about Buddhism. Go to a Buddhist. He'll tell you all about it. If you want to learn about the holy days, don't go to Perry Stone, some of these others who don't have a clue as to what they're talking about. Leviticus 23 verse 4 says, these are my feasts. These are the feasts of the Lord. Actually, uh, uh, verse 2 calls them the feast of God. Verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord. Now, Passover starts it, and then seven weeks after, you have uh, the Feast of Pentecost. Now, let's go to verse 34. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles. I read this to you last week. For seven days. How many days? Seven, not eight. Seven. On the first day shall be a holy convocation, so you don't go to work that day. You shall do no servile work. Now, he said seven days you're to offer an offering made by fire. You can't do that. Only the priest could do that. And then this mysterious verse, or part of the verse, on the eighth day shall be a holy convocation. It is a solemn assembly. Do no servile work. That's also a Sabbath. When it says do no servile work, that's a Sabbath. Verse 37, these are not Jewish feasts like Hanukkah. These are the feast of the Lord. Go down to verse 39. In the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you gathered in the fruit of the land, you're to keep a feast to the Lord. How long? Seven days. That's all. Seven. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day a Sabbath. Now, this is kind of confusing to the average American reader. If I were to write this in a, in a paper in high school, the teacher would probably give me an F because she'd say, you're not explaining this, because God did not explain it. How can you have a seven-day feast, and yet you have an eighth day? Obviously, the eighth day is not part of the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's something that, that the Protestants who get on television and try to teach this do not understand. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles begins on the 15th day, so this is the 22nd day of the month. Now, you don't need to turn to these scriptures, but I'll just give them to you. You can write them down. Colossians 2, 16 and 17 talks about holy days and eating and drinking in respect to the holy days are shadows Verse 17, they're shadows. But Hebrews 10, 1 says, the law has a shadow of things to come. Passover was a shadow of the Lamb of God dying for the sins of the world. Uh, Hebrews 10, 1. Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. Verse
verse 16, don't let people judge you in respect to eating and drinking or a holy day, new moon, or the Sabbath. It's nobody's business but God's. You don't answer to people. You answer to God. Trumpets pictures the second coming, the Day of Atonement. I'll talk about that on the Day of Atonement, what it means, but basically it's when the whole world is going to be atoned to God. And then on the fifth, that's on the 10th day of the seventh month. Again, not the 10th day of October, you understand. The 10th day from the time the new moon is seen in autumn, um, the, first, uh, the, day, the first day of the seventh month is trumpets. The 10th day is Day of Atonement. The 15th is Feast of Tabernacles. Chronologically, we see what happens. Passover is the death of Christ. Seven weeks later, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Chronologically. What's next? What's the church been looking for for 2,000 years? Second coming. Trumpets. When Christ returns, the devil's going to be put away. All nations will be atoned to God the Father through Christ. Pictured by the Day of Atonement. What happens next? Well, after everybody has fasted and repented, we sit down and party. Feast of Tabernacles for a whole week. We party. And, of course, you can ask anybody... Talk to any rabbi, well, rabbis, whether talk to any, uh, don't ask rabbi, talk to uh, commentary. I meant to say commentaries. Check your commentaries. Also, people like Pat Robertson will take my Schofield Reference Bible tells me the Feast of Tabernacles pictures the millennium, the 1,000 year reign of Christ. That's why for seven days they would feast and rejoice and be happy. Now, we just observe the holy days because we don't have enough people to go out and have a camp meeting. But I've been in camp meetings. I mean, we'd have parties, we'd do things, we'd sit around the campfire and talk, people sit around and have Bible studies, cook out and grill out. You talk about fun, brother, that's how we're supposed to do it. But we had thousands of people doing it when I did it down in the 70s. I still do it, but I mean, I don't have the camp out because we're not enough people. But when we had 8,000 people to show up at one feast site, man, I mean, we had 100 people in the choir. Organ on one side, piano on the other side. That's a great way of doing it. So the way, so when we do this in the millennium, and all nations are celebrating this, it's going to be be a week long festival when all the kids are going to be out of the school. Everybody's going to take off work. All the businesses close down, and for a whole week, we're going to worship Jesus Christ. All nations. Philippians two. Every knee will bow. So the people that don't want to bow the knee are still going to keep the feast of tabernacles, and they're going to keep doing it until they like it. After a while, they're going to say, "Hey, I enjoy this." Can't be an atheist anymore, not when God is here and everybody sees him. So what does the Feast of Tabernacles picture? The thousand years. Now, you see the chronology, death of Christ, coming of the Holy Spirit, trumpets, second coming, day of atonement, the whole world is atoned, Feast of Tabernacles, thousand years. One, two, three, four, five, six. Do you understand? Chronologically, it's sequential. So the eighth day comes after the Feast of Tabernacles, which is now concluded. Because it's only, not eight days, seven. So this eighth day, prophetically, Paul said these are shadows of things to come. Prophetically, the eighth day pictures what happens after the Feast of Tabernacles, or what happens after the thousand years. This eighth day pictures what happens when the millennium is concluded. Now what is the very next thing that's going to happen? The dead will be raised. Now, there are two resurrections. Revelation 20, verse 4, the saints are going to come up in the first resurrection. Even people have been beheaded and martyred for the witness of Jesus. They come up in the first resurrection. Then you have a thousand years when they're going to rule and reign with Christ. And after that, the white throne judgment, the dead will be raised. What dead? Those who were whose names were not written in the book of life. <clears throat> now, uh, how many billions and billions and billions of people have lived from Adam and Eve up until today, that don't know Jesus. Never even heard of him. So this, the, the brains, again, and when you see it chronologically, Passover, then the wave sheaf, he was, he was resurrected at that time. Fifty days later, he, he baptized people in the Holy Spirit. Trumpets, he returns. I mean, when you see it sequentially, the very next thing after the thousand years is the great white throne judgment. Now today I'm going to hit the peripheral issues. And on the actual day itself, we'll go into the, the real Get down to the nitty gritty of man. Let's go to the book of Job. That's right before Psalms, as all of us should know. <clears throat> Job 1 and verse 1. <clears throat> there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright. He had feared God, he eschewed or shunned evil. 
This is the man we're dealing with. Look at chapter 29. What's this got to do with the last great day? Just keep listening. Chapter 29 of Job, verse 12. Job was a righteous man. I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help him. Verse 13, the blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. In other words, I helped the widow in her time of affliction. That was before the days of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, food stamps. He helped the widow. Look at chapter 31 and verse 5. If I've walked with vanity, implying he had not, or if my foot has hasted to deceit, implying he had not. Verse 6, let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know my integrity. Verse 7, if my step has turned out of the way and my heart walked after my eyes and any blood has cleaved to my hands, then let me sow and let another eat, yet let my offspring be rooted out. In other words, let God punish me if I've done wrong. If my heart, verse 9, has been deceived by a woman, if I've laid wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind unto another and let others bow down upon her. I mean, Job's getting specific here. For this is a heinous crime. He was a righteous man who saw that. Look at verse 13. If I did despise the cause of my manservant or my maidservant when they contended with me, what then shall I do when God rises up? So he says, if I did these things. Look at verse 16. If I have withheld the poor from their desire, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel myself alone, and the fatherless has not eaten thereof, he's saying, if I've done these things, he's implying he has not. Uh, verse 19, if I've seen any perish for lack of clothing, or any poor without covering. Verse 21, if I've lifted up my hand against the fatherless, he never did that when I saw my help in the gate. Remember, God says he's a perfect man. Verse 24, if I've made gold my hope instead of God, or have said to the fine gold, you are my confidence, don't put confidence in money. If I've done all these things, you see. Verse 25, if I rejoice because my wealth is great and because my hand had gotten it, my hand had gotten it, if I've done these things. Now, you understand what he's saying? If I've done these things, then let me be punished. What he's implying is, I never did these things. Now, let's read on. Remember that Job is a perfect man here. Look at... Um, Verse 29. If I rejoiced at the destruction of him that hated me, or lifted up myself when evil found him. Now let's stop there. Should we rejoice when the wicked die without God? Should we be happy? <laughs> You're going to get yours, buddy. Is that how we should be? Neither have I suffered my mouth to sin by wishing a curse to his soul. In other words, you're sinning when you wish a curse on the wicked. He mentioned Dante a while ago. Dante's Inferno, it's a, he calls it the divine comedy. He's got some popes he doesn't like in the bottom pits of hell. It's a comedy. You know, where does he find the popes? Down there in hell. So the people were supposed to laugh at it. Look at verse 39. If I have eaten the fruits thereof without money, or have caused the owners thereof to lose their life, then let thistles grow instead of wheat and cockle instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. What he's saying is, I don't want bad things to happen to the wicked. I don't want my enemies to suffer. I've never wished a curse on them. And yet, how many Christians are saying, oh, well, that fellow there, he's going to get what he deserves one day. He's going to bust hell wide open. Hey, <laughs> boy, like I can't wait. I can't wait for him to suffer. That's a wrong attitude. That's a wrong attitude to have. What is this eighth day? It's a holy day. And the New Testament is called the last great day. Now this word great is also translated high day in John 19 and 31. So you could translate the last high day. So I'm talking about the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the seventh. It's talking about the high day on the eighth. Why is the eighth day, this last high day, a day of rejoicing? Because remember, God's Sabbaths are a day of feasting and rejoicing and celebrating. Are we rejoicing because our enemies are going to be resurrected from the dead and they're going to get what's coming to them? Is that why we're rejoicing? What kind of an attitude? What kind of a heart is that? Now, I knew a, a bully in school. His own father had him put in prison. The Marine Corps threw him out with a disagreeable discharge. 
his teachers, I remember told my mother one time, that is the meanest kid I've ever had in class. He was born mean, it seemed like. I think if anybody ever had a demon, that boy did. I never met anybody meaner than that kid. He died just being reckless with a car, out goofing around one Friday night. That day, his sister saw him out here walking down the street in Annapolis, just ran into him by accident, and she said, Butch, that's what they called him, because he was a, he was a bully. Hey, Butch, you need to get right with God. You need to find God. I want you to start going to church. His last words to her was, were, I don't have time for God. That sounds like Butch. I don't have time for God. That night he was killed. He didn't have time for God. Now, that kid made my life. You want to hear about hell? He made my life hell in the seventh and eighth grades. I mean, I just drive by his house and I could feel my blood pressure going. Just drive by his house. And when he died, it was like the whole community went, whew. They should have sent him to Iran, let him go over and fight those people. That would have been a blessing for America. He was one mean character. But what kind of an attitude would I have to wish him to be tortured for all eternity? And that's what people think. He's going to be tortured. In fact, they think he's there right now. I don't rejoice over that. That's what people think. And Christians will say, well, they're getting what's coming to them. Ha, 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 as if that's a good thing. Well, is that what's going to happen to all the people who come up the second resurrection? Are they going to be thrown into the lake of fire and burned for eternity? If all are to be cast into hell to be tortured throughout the endless eons of everlasting eternity, everlasting consciousness, should you and I rejoice? Why do we have a day of rejoicing? There's something good about the last great day. There's something good about the great white throne judgment. And the good is not that we should rejoice because people like this guy I just described are going to be tortured, thrown into hellfire. That is nothing to rejoice for. Remember the book of Ezekiel, God says, I have no pleasure that the wicked die. There's no pleasure in that. If someone does end up in the lake of fire, should you and I be saying, ha, ha, you got what's coming to you? Or should we not have a tear in our eye? Who was it? Charles Haddon Spurgeon who said, never tell a man that he's going to hell unless you have tears in your eyes. Don't rejoice. You're going to hell one day. <laughs> Don't ever do that. If you ever have to tell a man that because he's lost and he's not accepting Christ and he's just living a wicked life, you say it with compassion because you want to see him saved. You don't want him to end up in the lake of fire. And Jesus is not bluffing. Read the book of Mark. It gets express. I mean, it's explicit. Where the worm dies not and the fire will never be quenched and it talks about this utter destruction of the wicked. It is nothing we rejoice over. Well, then why are we rejoicing on this last great day? Because the very next thing that happens is the great white throne judgment. Why should we be celebrating and rejoicing? That contradicts the attitude a righteous man is to have toward the sinner. Go with me, if you will, to the New Testament, Luke chapter 6, or at least write these down and look them up and do your own study. One of my students pointed this out to me some years ago. I had never seen it in this context before. And I love it when I learn things from others. And he brought this out. In Luke chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said, love your enemies. If you love them, you're not going to be happy when they end up in the lake of fire. Love your enemies and do good. Lean hoping for nothing, any reward be great and be shown the highest. Notice this. For he, the highest, God, is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Now, you don't, have, don't answer this out loud, but just think about it. How kind would it be of God to give somebody like Butch everlasting life so he can torture them and torment them throughout the eons of eternity? That's not kindness. I asked a friend of mine from Matthews, met him in Oklahoma, and I talked to him a little bit about hell. Didn't get a chance to finish it, but I said... Uh, if God sent you out to a planet and said you can do anything you want to, make your own Adam and Eve, and the ones that obey you, give them everlasting life. Well, what do I do with the ones that don't obey me? Do anything you want to to them. I don't care. I said, Jerry, what would you do to them? He said, you mean if it was totally up to me? I said, yeah, totally up to you. What would you do with the wicked? He said, well, brother, he said, if it was up to me, I'd put them out of their misery. He told me that. I'd put them out of their misery. I said, you mean, I said, you, mean you would not give them everlasting life so you could torture them forever? He said, I wouldn't do that. No. I said, you mean you have more love than God? Well, that didn't make sense. He said, well, brother, he called me brother. He said, well, brother, if the Bible teaches that. I said, the question is, have we understood that correctly? 
Does the Bible really teach that God is evil to the evil man? Or is he not kind to the evil? What would be the greatest kindness you could do for those people? Now again, we're still not rejoicing that they die. There's something more to the last great day than that. But we see that God is kind. And one of my students brought this out. How could there be everlasting torture if God is kind to the evil? Next time a, a, a preacher tells you that brother, he's going to go to hell and he's going to burn for all eternity. You just say, wait a minute, God is kind to the evil. How's that kindness? That doesn't make sense. 98% of churches teach this. Not all. I know John's church doesn't teach it. Not all churches teach this. But 98%, I would say, teach that if you die unsaved, you are going to be tormented for all eternity in conscience, conscious everlasting torment. So in other words, their bodies are on fire. People have burned in fire. Man, it hurts. They have to get skin grass. But imagine your body is on fire, burning and burning and burning, and yet you could never die. Just suffer. Just burn in flames forever and ever. And your whole body is on fire. Yes? I guess you've got immortal worms, don't you? <laughs> when Jesus said you'll be cast into hell, the Greek word there is Gehenna, which means the Valley of Hinnom, and they would throw bodies in there, and the worms would totally consume those the bodies of criminals and animals. They'd throw them in, in Gehenna, and the worms would consume their bodies. It was a gross, grotesque way of describing utter destruction. So not describing the last judgment. Well, in other words, he was talking about Gehenna itself, but that's a symbol of the last judgment. In other words, if you're thrown into hell, just like those bodies were totally destroyed in Gehenna, so in the lake of fire, you'll be totally destroyed. That was his whole point. Because obviously you don't have worms in hell. Why would God, you would put a worm in a fire, would you? It'd be cruel. Yes, sir. On the, on the great white throne judgment, those are not coming to Christ or his uh, they will be given that basically just like a second chance. Well, it's not a second chance necessarily, right? Most of them never had well, a first chance. Okay, well, uh, yeah. So for those that are butch, they'll be given a second chance. Yeah, if you ever had a first chance. Yeah, you know, ultimate, yeah. Ultimately, to me, that is the good news. That's the good news, yeah. Everybody who's ever lived will be given at least one chance. At least one. And if you grew up in America and you've heard Billy Graham and you've heard other preachers and you didn't get saved till you were 30 or 40 or 50, look how many chances you had. Won't God give these people at least one chance? At least. It wouldn't make, that's why it's good news. Every one of our relatives who died unsaved. I knew a lady up in Virginia. Her mother was mean, according to her. I never knew her mother. But she's even when she died and I went with her to see her mother there in the hospital, her mother had just died. We walked in there and she, the first thing she said in tears you mean old woman, you. Her mother was a mean lady and died unsaved. But she had heard what I was teaching about this, that she's not automatically going to end up in the lake of fire. She's going to come up in the second resurrection. And, of course, I'll talk more about this on the last great day, and I'll get into the nitty-gritty of it at that time. Right now, I'll the peripheral issues. Now, think about this. If the wages of sin, of, of sin is death, if, does that mean... You're not going to be dead, but you're going to be in everlasting tor torment. Here's the thing: if the if the ultimate, oh, were there any questions on? Oh yeah, there were some questions. Okay, we're going to have anybody to ask the questions. I'll get Jeanette out here a little bit to answer your questions. Yeah, we can come to the end. But... Yeah. Um, if the wages of sin is not death, but it's everlasting torture. Now, 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 think about this: the churches of this world teach. That if you end up in hell, you will never die. You'll be conscious, just as conscious as you are right now. And your bodies will be on flames and you will burn and burn and burn and burn. Now, if that's the penalty, think about it. If that is the penalty, then let me ask you this theological question. Did Jesus Christ ever take your penalty? For him to take my penalty, he would have had to have gone to hell and stayed there in conscious torment. He's there right now in hell, burning and burning and burning forever so I don't have to go. And for all eternity, God would send his son to hell to pay for my sins. Folks, that is not what happened. Where does the Bible say Jesus is right now? Right here. The 
right hand of God the Father in the third heaven. So the wages of sin is not conscious, everlasting torment in hell, or Jesus never took your penalty. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died. Amen. And also, a part of the wages, some of the temporal wages, the temporal wages, is like John was talking about a while ago, suffering. And sometimes before you die, you suffer, you're in pain. Jesus he took, plenty of that. took plenty of pain and suffering. So he took everything that, that you and I could take. He took it. The ultimate penalty is not to live forever in hell, because if that's the case, Jesus didn't take it. The ultimate penalty is death. The ultimate penalty is death. It cannot be forever and ever living in hell. Now, let's go to Matthew 25, 41. I may run just a little bit over the day, but I'll try not to. It's raining outside anyway because of our hurricane out there. Uh, it's only going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. But, but we do have some questions on this. Would you take the questions over here? Matthew 25, 41, and she can get the question. They're playing the Matthew game. Uh, what was the questions first? Have you seen any of them? No. Okay. Um, oh, shoot. Verse 40, the king shall answer and say, Truly I say to you, as much as you've done this, at least these are my brother. Verse 41, the bad people. Then he'll say to them with the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil's angels. But it's everlasting fire. Verse 46, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the right hand, but the righteous into life eternal. And after we take the questions here, I'll explain what that's talking about. Have you heard, had any of the questions yet? No, I've read this one says, do you think multi-billionaires might know about this and they have underground bunkers to keep them safe when the nukes hit, nukes hit America? Yeah, I think it's very possible that some of them do. We know the President of the United States has an underground bunker. In fact, uh, they have an underground railroad there at the Capitol because I've been in it. Well, people have built all these fallout shelters in the 50s, but they wouldn't even work now, though, would they? If oh, any yeah. of them are even still in existence. Yeah, so, so, yeah, millionaires, billionaires probably have some place. They can take off and fly and got some place in the seashell islands where they can hide. Go ahead. Okay, next one says, is, this, is his spirit on us as we are in the grave? All right, that's a good question. That, that's based on what Dr. Roller said. Uh, no, your, God's spirit is not on your rotting day, die, dead, corrupt body. But what that is saying is, is that God is ubiquitous, that, his, that through his Holy Spirit, he's everywhere in the entire universe. That's what it's saying. Not that the Holy Spirit is going to be resting on your corpse. There's no scripture that says that. Okay. But, and you're not going to be breathing, which is the point of the spirit. Yeah, you're not going to be breathing. So, no. Okay. Your breath is not on you. Yeah. There's no spirit at all. Those are the last questions. Okay, good, good, good question. Okay. Some of those others might not have been questions. Might have been. <clears throat> no, it was just comments. Like, okay. there's one that says, "Happy Sabbath from Canada. Great study. Um, World War Three is going to be wild. Amen." <laughs> yeah. Those are the comments. World War Three be wild. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, verse forty-one says, "Depart from me, you ever you're cursed into everlasting fire." Everlasting does mean what it says, but it doesn't mean the flames are everlasting. It means the result is everlasting. And I've got biblical proof for that. Uh, so everlasting in Greek, I looked it up in Greek. Everlasting is the same word translated eternal in the book of Jude in verse 7, where it says the example of eternal fire is Sodom. They were burned with eternal fire. But the flames didn't last and last and last, but the result of the destruction, or the result of the flames, the, the destruction was everlasting. Yes, sir. Uh, Jude verse 7, I believe. And he was burned up and never rebuilt. It was never rebuilt. It never will be rebuilt because the result of that fire is everlasting. Therefore, the fire is called everlasting. So the idea that God is going to torture people forever doesn't make sense. You don't need to turn there, but it's Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is not everlasting life in hell. It's death. Eternal death. Now, because it says, but the gift of God is life eternal, the wages is death eternal, and the gift of God is life eternal. Two different things. So, how is God going to be kind to the evil if he's going to torture people forever? 
So what did Jesus mean? Don't turn to the scripture. We don't have time. But what did he mean in Matthew 10, 28 when he says, Don't fear people that can destroy your body. They can't kill your soul. But rather you destroy, or I'm sorry, you fear him who can destroy. Fear God. Don't ever fear the devil. Fear God who can destroy the soul as well as the body. Not just the body. God can destroy you, the essence, you, the real person. Utterly annihilate you. He said, in hell fire. And we will get to that in the study of hell. We'll yeah, when we get into the New Testament. <laughs> now let's go to John 7, 37. I'm going a little bit over time here, but like we said, it's raining outside. And, and uh, I think it's worth it. John 7 and verse 37. Verse 2, it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. And in verse 37, in the last day, that great of the feast, that high day of the feast, the eighth day, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me. What did he mean by that? All right, keep that thought in mind. And we're going to come back to this. Now let's look at Romans 11. Romans 11. Again, I'm hitting the peripheral issues of this holy day. Romans 11 and let's read verses 7 and 8. What then? Israel has not obtained what he seeks. Now sometimes they refer to the nation as he because it was named after a man. But the election has obtained it and over and over and over when you look up elect or election it refers to born again Christians. The election has, has obtained it and the rest, who's the rest? Israel were blinded according as it is written, not the devil, but God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. So God has blinded Israel in order to let the Gentiles come in until the fullness of the Gentiles, and then he's going to take the blinders off. And verse 26 says, and so all Israel will eventually be saved when he takes the blinders off, but not today. Most Israelites today, and certainly most Jews, are not converted Christians. Don't turn there, but John 6, 44 and 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28. These two passages tell us that nobody can come to Christ unless the Father draws them. Paul said, you see your calling, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28. You see your calling, brother. God didn't call many of the mighty, the noble. The word in Greek means noble birth. You're not, you don't have a lot of royalty here. From royal families. Uh, we don't have any billionaires here. But we don't have celebrities here. But God has called the weak things, the, the, the base things of the world, the things that are not the nobodies like me, for example, to confound the things that are. Nobodies. Complete nobodies. God calls people like us to confound the wise of this world. But right now, the majority of the world is blinded. Can God send them to any kind of a hellfire when he himself blinded them so they could not see? Now people have asked the question, why did Jesus speak in parables? And I've explained it's because God did not want people to understand at that time. There are various reasons why God blinds people. 1 Corinthians 2.8 says, had they understood he was the Lord of glory, they would not have crucified him. If, if, if the Pharisees had understood who Jesus was, they'd have fallen down and worshipped him. But wait a minute. If they understood who he was, how is God's plan going to be carried out? The Pharisees were the ones who had him arrested, who took him to Pilate and said, kill this man. They did not know he, who he was because God had blinded them. Why? To carry out his plan of salvation. And right now, most of Israel is blinded until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Once God has got the last Gentile in, he says, okay, now we'll take the blinders and let Israel come in. The first to be called was Israel. The second to be called, or the last to be called, are us Gentiles. We Gentiles, I should say. I already say that. But the first, Israel, will be last. And the last will be first. Those of us called last as Gentiles will be in the first resurrection, and the Israelites who were called first will be last. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. Romans chapter 9, I'm just about through here. Romans chapter 9, and 
Verse 6. Not though the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, are they all children of God. But in Isaac your seed will be called, meaning those who are of the promise. So just because you're an Israelite doesn't make you a child of God. That is, they who are the children of the flesh, the natural born Israelites, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise. That's you guys are counted for the seed. Who's seed? Abraham's seed. God now says you're Abraham's seed. But this is the word of the promise. And he goes back to how Sarah was to have a son. And it's through Isaac that the spiritual seed is called. Verse 11, for the children being not yet born, having neither done any good or evil, that the purpose of God might stand according to election, not of works, but of him that calls. The elder shall serve the younger. Verse 13, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. God personally chose to honor Jacob over Esau. Now let's look closely at the next few verses. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid, for he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on him, I'll have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. It's my business. Shut up. <laughs> I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. Yeah, but God, that's not fair. Shh. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. Now, that's God's business. So then, now this is very important. It is not of him that wills. I want to be saved. I want to know the true God. I want to know the truth. And you think, a lot of people like Shirley MacLaine want to know the truth. So they go to India to learn Hinduism. They never do. They're, the Bible says ever seeking, but never come to a knowledge of the truth. They're ever seeking. They want to know, and they never find it. It is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, like Shirley MacLaine, running all the way to India. People running around the world trying to find the truth. The hippies in the 1960s would go to Tibet, studying under some lama, trying to find the truth. And they're blinded, and they don't see it. It is not of him that wills or him that runs, but it's of God who shows mercy. God has shown mercy to you in this room. He's shown mercy to all of us who are converted because God wants to save us and let us be in the first resurrection. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised you up that I might show my power in you, that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he'll have mercy and whom he will, he hardens. God has hardened the hearts of the Jewish people against Christ. And he's bringing the Gentiles in instead for right now. Thou wilt say then to me, why does God yet find fault? For who has resisted his will? Here's Paul's theological answer. No, but oh man, who are you that replies against God? <laughs> in other words, that's God's business. Let God do whatever he wants to do. Verse 22, what if God willing to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared in the glory. What if God chose to make his power known by hardening Pharaoh's heart? I mean, there were a couple of times, at least two times in the name when Pharaoh said, I repent, I repent, that's enough. And the next verse says, but God hardened his heart. The poor fellow didn't have a chance. Now, God did take a real nice, sweet man and make him hard heart. God took a hard-hearted man to start with, and to him that hath shall more be added. He already had a hard heart. God just helped him out. <coughs> Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. Notice it says that God has called us. Now, I'm going to go back to John. You're holding your place there. I'm going to conclude with this. In John 7. What is the meaning of this last great day? It's not that we're rejoicing because, oh goody, all these billions of people are going to go to hell and burn forever. Uh-uh, that's not why we're rejoicing. Right now, people are blind and they can't see. Verse 37, in the last day of that great day of the feast, Jesus explains the meaning of this last great day. If any man thirsts now, let him come to me and drink. There are people today who are thirsting and can't find the right thing. Take the drink. They're hungry, but they can't find the right food. They're, they're, they're searching, they can't find the truth. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which wasn't yet given. In other words, there's going to be a day when the devil's going to be put away, and God will say, Okay, now 
If anybody's thirsty, if anybody wills, if anybody chooses to run, you're going to find what you're looking for. The Jews have sought it, sought it, sought it, and they can't find it. In the book of Romans, it says Israel has not found what he seeks for. Remember that? Did I read that to you? I don't know if I read that to you or not. Yeah. I did read that to you. Okay. Israel has not found what he seeks for. He's not finding it. He can't find it. He's seeking, but he can't find it because God has blinded Israel so that Israel can't find it. But the day will come when anybody who wants to be saved, who wants to know the truth, will find it. And the great white throne judgment, with no devil around, what if Adolf Hitler comes up the great white throne judgment? No, he's not coming up in the first resurrection. What if Hitler did fall to his knees and say, I was a rascal. Can you ever forgive me? I wonder what God would do. What would God do? What would God do to your worst enemy? Like my worst enemy was this fellow Butch. What if he falls to his knees and says, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I wonder what God would do. We'll talk about that, and I'll give you the answer to that on the last great day. Hey, yes, ahead. any questions? <laughs> you, know, you talk about how people seek to go, was who was who a Hindu? Yeah, uh, I, as far as I know, he was a Hindu. He said he said a quote here. He says, "I like the Christians. Said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians." Yeah, your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Exactly. So when the world seeks for other things, what part do you like? 